Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. It's only May, but already the garden says, I'm hot and I'm dry. And you know what? Sometimes that's just the way it is in South Carolina. But we're tough and we are gardeners and we're going to get through it. But tonight's an easy night and a wonderful night because you're joining us for SCETV's own gardening show, Making It Grow. I'm Amanda McNulty of Clipson Extension, and I'm so happy that you can be with us tonight. Teresa Young is in the chat room, and oh goodness, she would love some company over there. And it's very easy to join her. And as soon as we go inside, she will tell you the simple steps that it takes to become a chatter. We have grand times with making it grow going places, and we recently got to go with my old professor from the University of South Carolina, former professor, not old professor, Dr. John Nelson, and his spring botany class, and you're going to enjoy our walk along the Columbia Canal River Walk. Also, we are so happy because Jackie Moore of the South Carolina Specialty Foods Association is here. The studio smells wonderful. I think you're really going to enjoy the wonderful guests that she has tonight as well. And we are so happy that Dr. John Nelson will be with us all, and as usual with his mystery plant. That's always a fun part of the show. And we have two mighty fine extension people from upstate who are going to be with us to answer your questions. Such a lot to do. Let's go inside and start the program. Our dear friend, Teresa Young. Teresa, we are so happy to congratulate you. I think you say felicitations to the bride um, on your <laughs> recent wedding. And we um, let everybody out there know that um, Teresa has a very fine gentleman who has, um, who is now part of her life from now on out. And we wish you all the very best. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, we hope to have a long and happy life together. We uh, invite you to join us live chat uh, tonight. Just go to the Making It Grow Facebook page. And thanks to you, we are now over 8,000 likes. It seems like yesterday we were hoping for 4,000, and now we have doubled that. And I only hope to see that number grow. You can join me in discussion tonight by clicking on the green Let's Talk icon. Once you do, you'll be directed into the chat room where you can log in with Facebook, Twitter, or Rumble Talk. Please do remember, if you're using a mobile device, you need to access Facebook with your favorite web browser, not the mobile application. I hope that we'll be engaged in some great conversation very soon. Already three speakers and two viewers, and hope that number grows very quickly. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. And Teresa, of course, is a natural resources agent, and water quality is of importance to everyone. And Teresa, now people are starting to mow their lawns, and you have told me that there's a practice that's better than putting those grass clippings out on the sidewalk. Tell me what it is, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, my pleasure. We definitely don't want them on the sidewalk where they can be transported by stormwater into our uh, storm drains, ditches, and right into our waterways where they can wreak havoc. But what you can do is just mow at the proper height, and as long as you do that, it's perfectly safe to leave those clippings on the grass where they essentially act as free fertilizer. So a lot less work for you and good for the grass. Thank you so much. And Mark Reno's with us. It's been a long time. We're so happy that you're here. Right. And today you came from another direction because you <laughs> um, said it's too hot down there in the low country. I'm moving north. And so tell me what your new responsibilities are and where you're housed. Sure. I'm in Anderson County at the Anderson Extension Service Office uh, right downtown. 
And my new responsibilities consist of working with the pecan growers, uh, the local food movement, and also providing arboriculture expertise at the Botanical Garden. Boy, the local food movement is big in the upstate. It's big everywhere. It is. And, and, and for good reason. Exactly. Yeah. We need to be eating healthier. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's fresher and it tastes better yeah. and it helps the local economy. Exactly. Yeah. And Dr. Bob Polomsky, um, who has become a professor since I first <laughs> met you, Bob, you've done so many wonderful things for us. Appreciate um, that. Helped us with the Master Gardener programs and you're a marvelous writer, wrote our book for us. But tell me what they've got you doing on campus now. Well, just like Dr. John Nelson, I'm teaching in the fall. Uh, landscape plant materials. So I'm kind of looking forward to this mystery plant. <laughs> and in the springtime, I teach urban tree care. And I find mis myself this summer seeking research grant money, uh, writing some articles uh, for trade journals. Also, going back to my dissertation, I still owe my committee as well as the scientific journal a publication or two from that. So oh. I'll be rather busy. But I do want to say, Amanda, I'm so happy to be here. I watch this show all the time. It's such a great experience to be in this studio seeing like you people are real. <laughs> this is really great. So thank you. I look forward to a really wonderful program. Well, welcome to real life. <laughs> and of course, I so frequently enjoy getting to hear you on your day when you have an hour of taking phone calls. So we are in the same business, trying to help people with their problems, aren't we? Thank you, man. And we're glad you're here to help us tonight. And of course, Jackie Moore of the South Carolina Specialty Foods Association is just doing such a wonderful job. As we said, the local movement is so important, supporting our entrepreneurs and their value-added products. And Jackie, tell me who we have tonight. Yes, I have certified South Carolina member from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. I have Lavinia Sabin, and she is with Lavinia's House. Welcome. Yes, thank you for having us. And you have an um, Indian dish, and tell us about your company. Well, we have our company, Lavinia's House, which is named after the fact that basically uh, people used to come to me all the time and ask how to make Indian food and I would tell them and then they'd immediately say can you make it for us <laughs> and so I did and here's the company and so you're making it for us and we're going to find out later in the show all the wonderful ways you can use your wonderful sauces back to you Amanda thank you and now we're going to check in with Dr. John Nelson, my former professor at the University of South Carolina and still my favorite professor from that institution. Dr. John Hey, Amanda. Hey, John. Oh, my goodness, you've gotten that coil that you had in your ear straightened out. You look a lot better. Um, and we are um, wishing you a good summer because I guess you've had graduation, haven't you? Uh, we have had graduation. I was unable to go to it uh, to see the vice president. Um, but, yeah, it's gotten a lot calmer here in Columbia because all the students are gone. Maybe a parking space is available here or there. It sure is, yeah. <laughs> Well, John, um, since we are going to have a segment with you walking on the river and how do we, Vivat Linnaeus, um, right now we're going to go ahead and have the mystery plant. Thank you, Vivat Linnaeus. Um, have the mystery plant right now. And um, Bob says he's real interested because he quizzes people on plants all the time. And so he's going to learn what it's like to be on the other side of the desk. So what have you got for us tonight? Okay. Well, I think that uh, Mark and, and Bob are going to know this one. It's not too hard. But I want to uh, make reference to the um, field trip that I had a little while ago this past weekend. As you know, I went up to Long Island and I was visiting with some family and uh -huh. we went botanizing and we found some, uh, <clears throat> my new friend Candy there, and we found a most wonderful, wonderful area. <clears throat> There's a place at the eastern end of Long Island called Montauk and it was just fascinating. The place up there that is Long Island is completely in the spring still. It was just the most amazing thing. You go very, <clears throat> you go up to a new place and you get into a different season. And here was a, <clears throat> a small tree or a large shrub that was actually quite common in the woods of uh, Long Island and the Hamptons, by the way. Ooh. And uh, it's in the, a, a plant that's in the rose family. Uh -huh. Beautiful flowers, white. Uh, petals, five white petals, and a bunch of stamens, like practically everything in the rose family has. And um, in the summertime, the ovaries of the flowers develop into purplish, blue, um, little tiny apple-like fruits that the, um, well, I can't tell you what the what the people call them, because that's the answer to the mystery plant. <laughs> well, does this plant grow down here in South Carolina? 
You know, it, it actually does. Um, oh. There are several species of this thing that grow in the southeast, and uh, it's actually, the genus is pretty widespread in um, the eastern United States. And they're not always very easy to tell apart. In fact, this is one of the more difficult genera for botanists to deal with. Well, they sure are pretty. Yeah, they, it does look lovely, and it looks like something maybe wildlife would John, enjoy. Go ahead. Before I ask for a lifeline, I was just curious to know about the fruit. Does it sort of have, it have an insipid flavor? Uh, you know, I've eaten these things, and they're um, they're not they're not particularly tasty to me, but the wildlife go go crazy for these things. What? And I think that the the people up in Long Island they they do like to eat them. Because they've given a name to the um, fruit, and thereby the, uh, <laughs> well, the answer I, to the mystery plant. I'm thinking you guys want to convene on this one? I, I'm, yeah. I'm at a loss. But, you, Mark, you say you're familiar with this area. and uh, are you, so, y'all, so give it a go. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a service berry in Amalankir. Well, well, of course it is. And you're oh, but, John, which is the, what is the specific epithet? I've been struggling with... That's a kind of number awesome. of these amelanchiers on campus, we've got also hybrids. Yeah. How do you differentiate them? Uh, don't ask me. It's, uh, um, <coughs> it's for, um, for better botanists than this one. But uh, I'm kind of thinking that this one is um, amelanchier canadensis. Mm. And it does uh, exhibit tremendous variation. Sometimes the plants right. are just uh, shrub-sized, and then they get to be small trees as mm. well. And um, I, I don't believe that this one is on our coast line like this, like it is up in um, New York, yeah. Connecticut. And that kind of thing. John, if, if I could beg a little bit more of your time, uh, you've heard of the term the shadblow service yeah. berry. And the sh oh, I've heard of uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> shadbush. Shad oh, shadblow. Is yeah. that right, shadblow? Yeah. Yeah. And apparently, I love common names, but as, as we know, uh, having to deal with uh, the common names can make life rather difficult when you're trying to figure out the names of these plants. But apparently also in some parts of the country that when the shad run, mm -hmm. right. this species of amelanchier actually blooms at that time. And mm. in the, up in the mountainous area, I think it used to be that things would start thawing out and the circuit preacher could get around and you could have a quick wedding if you need to, oh. or a funeral. <laughs> I did not know that. That was very good. Well, some people's families need more quick weddings than other people's families. I'm sure you're from a far nicer family than mine. Anyway, um, John, thank you so very much. And we're so excited that we know someone who got to go to the Hamptons. Woo, yeah. woo, woo. And, um, and thank you for bringing back that beautiful picture. And I noticed that, that y your friend, that young lady, you said she had her coat on. Imagine That's having oh, a coat on. it was chilly up there. Woo, it was hot down here. Well, John, we um, yeah. thank you so much. And, and everybody's going to enjoy taking a field trip with you a little bit later in the show and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, John, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Here I am. I'm so excited. I forgot to, you're so kind about identifying things for people. And please remind our viewers of how they can get materials or pictures to you in case they have a puzzle of their own. Well, sure. And if anybody's watching from Long Island, I'd be very happy to look <laughs> at your plants. All you got to do is send me a picture as a, uh, a email attachment we get those all the time, and they, they usually work out pretty well. I am looking forward to seeing some pictures in focus now. Uh, that's kind of helpful. Okay. All right, John, <laughs> thank you again. And now we've got, we'll talk to you next week, and now we've got a caller. Charlie's calling us from Georgetown. Hello, Charlie. Thanks for calling us tonight, and how can we help you? Hey, Amanda. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I hope you are, too. Yeah, I've got... Uh, Two things I wanted to run by you. Okay. I travel in three states. I travel in South Carolina, Georgia, and over into North Alabama. And I go up 26 and 20 across. And something I've been noticing for the last couple of years, and you tell me if I'm wrong, I have noticed that more and more wild uh, uh, Bradford pear trees. Oh, okay. And they seem yep. to be getting very invasive. Okay. And I'm wondering if we don't have a ton of berry experience. That Okay. And what's your second question, Charlie? And I have an apple orchard, and I always have problems with Japanese beetles. <laughs> so I need some help with that. All I right. tried the traps, and it seems like it just draws. Well, there we go. Well, first of all, um, Durant Ashmore, who comes on the show, is from the upstate, and he writes column after column yeah. about the horrible problem with these 
Bradford pears, mm -hmm. and I guess it's it's not the original one, and it's one right. that's just terrible with thorns. Can you elaborate on it, please? I think the majority of the spread is birds eating the fruit when they're ripe, and uh, they take them off and deposit them somewhere else. So I mean, I am seeing them uh, sporadically through the the roadways and other areas, but uh, yeah, it's not it's it's still. Uh, you know, it's not a good ornamental plant, and it's reverting back to its original tree. And the, the original, thorn. as I understand, has is armed horrifically. Mm -hmm. The calorie pear calorie. is what Charlie is talking about. And Charlie, I did not plant those <laughs> pears. Because <laughs> sometimes I do find that horticulturists get the blame, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps okay. rightfully so. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, Cleveland Select and Bradford and a lot of other Pyrus caloriana cultivars. Mm -hmm. And Bradford... Apparently they were able to, cult to <clears throat> pollinate each other, so we ended up with And they one produce these small fruits, and Mark mm -hmm. talks about the birds carrying them hither and yon. And they're a problem. They do form these thorns thickets as yep. you've observed as he has observed and it is becoming an, an evasive noxious weed and another problem with it also is that um, if you try you can't even take a tractor in because it'll ruin the tires yeah. um, and now we've talked so much about that that I can't remember what a second the question Japanese ja beetles. Oh, the Japanese beetles yeah. oh, oh it's a simple question apple tree. <laughs> so easy um, because he's been trapping them and sometimes the trap <laughs> doesn't do yeah, what you want. It's more of a magnet uh, I would get rid of the traps and maybe move to a BT or one of the more natural products out there. Most of the time, the Japanese beetles don't cause enough damage to really injure the tree, but at times they can be more of a pest. So, so could he call his local extension office if he feels like there's a pesticide that he needs to apply? And yes. they could recommend one yeah. that would be safe and, so. and, rec and, and labeled for that use. That would be my okay. recommendation. But the traps, I guess they put out... Um, like perfume. Yeah. Hormones. yeah. <laughs> and so it does Hormones. bring them yeah. in. All righty. <laughs> uh, Brenda's calling us from Dorchester. Brenda, we're mighty glad to talk to you tonight. How can we help you? Uh, yes. Um, I wanted to say to Amanda, it was a pleasure to meet her at the Art Fields in Lake City. Oh, thank we you for coming. We were there for our high school, high school reunion. Yeah. So <laughs> we were, you were there, to meet you. You were there for, for Stanley McKenzie's <laughs> high school reunion too, weren't you? I beg your pardon? Weren't you, the, you were in school with Stanley McKenzie, I think, weren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. He's a classmate of mine. Yeah. Um, the question I have is really two parts. Um, treatment for nut grass as well as sand spurs. Oh, oh goodness. Oh, boy, make it tough. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> Didn't mean to make it. Bob, you well, probably wrote the fact sheet on it. Well, I'm just thinking about <laughs> both both difficult issues. Now, the sand yeah. spur, I think, if you put out a pre-emergent at the right time, you can get some control with that. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the sand spur, right now, it is producing those really thorny burrs that, that end up in your socks and pant yeah. legs. It's just really a problem. It's actually best to control that with a pre-emergent herbicide in the fall yeah. and manage it at that time because right now they're senescing. They're on their way out. And I think we have a fact sheet on that at HGIC. Correct. Now, what about the nut grass? Oh. There's no silver bullet for either one of these. I mean, it's talk like about the cultural aspects. We saw some nut sedge today, and I really feel that we can manage a lot of our weed problems if we if we try to create an environment that's healthier for the turf grass, mm -hmm. so right. it can naturally outcompete weeds yeah. for light water and nutrients. But talk about that environment we saw today with nut sedge. Oh, right down the road here. I mean, yes, with the quarry dust and the new planting of trees and the courtyard back over here. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just a difficult situation. The trees were planted too deeply, and the nut sedge was already breaking through the, the quarry oh, dust. Oh, oh. That's now, a menace weed. I mean, it's a there, difficult there, one to control. There are herbicides you can use. Bassagran is one. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one has this trade name of sledge, sledge. sedgehammer. Sedgehammer, yeah, I guess yeah. it is. But again, but you need to be culturally, careful. Culturally, I think yeah. you, you will have a difficult time controlling nut sedge. Manage the moisture situation. If you've got a low spot, fill that in, but try to create an environment for the turf grass that is going to allow it to compete with the nut So make sage. the best situation you can for the turf grass, and then it will hopefully be able to um, t get right, the I'll upper hand. It. I'll on the, on the I'll okay, yep. all right. And Ron is calling us from Darlington. We're glad to have you on the phone. Ron, and what's happening in your garden? Good afternoon. Um, I have some white pines uh -huh. that are approximately 10 to 12 years old yes. and around 15 foot tall. Uh-huh. And I've had one now that's completely dead, and another that's starting. It starts from the bottom, and the branches are turning brown. Mm -hmm. Well, um, gosh, Ron, um, <laughs> Darlington is a warm part yeah. of the state, I think, for white pines. And I, I yeah, don't really is. think there's anything to do but just kind of live with the fact that they're going to be kind of short-lived, you think? They're going to be short-lived. I mean, I've seen a few in microclimates where they were shaded in the afternoon and the late evening. but. Uh, 
like you, you hit the right on the nail on the head. I mean, it's it's just a difficult environment. It's probably not get enough winter to restore the carbohydrates and keep the plant healthy. Um, but they're mighty pretty. They are pretty. They really are, they but are it's pretty. a mountain species. Yeah. It likes yeah. the high altitudes. And so again, right plant, right place. Is exactly. Really, yeah, That's is. right. Okay. Um, Teresa, we're wondering how things are going over there in the chat room. Have you got some people who are brave enough to chat, or are they all just watching? <laughs> We do have some brave people chatting. 12 speakers, still nine viewers hanging on the fence, not quite ready to join in the conversation, but that's okay. We don't mind. Um, we've been talking a little bit about how hot it is, and the latest question was about snow peas and if you could plant a second crop. And so if you're ever looking for information about what you can plant and when to plant it, HGIC has a wonderful fact sheet called Planning a Garden. Um, and then also, so I was looking at the Garden Peas fact sheet, and it turns out that they are cool weather plants, so uh, we definitely wouldn't want to be planting another. The planting dates range from January to mid-February, depending on what part of the state that you're in. So if you haven't joined in the conversation in the chat room, please do. I'm sure you have uh, lots to add to our conversation. Amanda? Thank you. And I'll tell you one thing that fact sheet says you can plant right now, and that would be okra. All right. <laughs> well, Bob, you've brought a fascinating um, show and tell in for us, and tell us what we've got fascinating here. Fascinating is the operative term, and I just love this aspect of the show. Amanda, we can bring in some really cool things, and I'm bringing in this plant. It's now, hold a, still so we can get a oh, good sorry. shot of it. It is a smoke bush, a Cotinus cagagria, yes. for our friend Dr. Nelson, and it is suffering from fasciation, and fasciation is the the pressing or the distortion of plant tissues. And we can see right here, Mark, let me just lay that down. We can lay this flat down on the you table. Sure it looks like somebody took an iron and ironed mm -hmm. out this stem. Mm -hmm. We can see all those buds that are present on one side, almost like a flounder on one side of the stem. <laughs> it's maybe not a good metaphor. No, I like but, that a lot. <laughs> but it's really interesting. It hasn't killed this smoke bush. It is probably a phytoplasma. It could be a virus. It uh, th this. Fasciation attacks a number of plants. So it just is in the environment and sometimes it happens. It sometimes it happens. Plants. It's systemic. Oh. So if I choose, if I don't like this, but I really do because it's an it's oddity. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I said earlier, Amanda, that I think even you would love using this in a floral arrangement. I do. Lots of people enjoy right. using fasciation. So there's no control for this thing. I could try to prune it out, but the possibility exists that it will manifest itself in other parts sure. of the plant. And I have to be very careful. And you reminded me about disinfecting my pruning shears. If I prune this smoke, Bush, I go to Mark Smoke Bush. There's a possibility I may be able to transmit that virus to his, uh -huh. and he may not like this effect. But fasciation <laughs> is fascinating, and I just really enjoy seeing this on my smoke bush. Yeah. And you can see that's still relatively healthy despite the distorted yeah. so, um So, so often when something goes wrong with our plants, we feel like we have to do something about mm -hmm. it. But many, you know, plants were here a long time before yes. we are. Don't you think often, often there are things that they can just continue to live with? Oh, and definitely. I mean, yeah. a little bit of stress and distortion is not a bad thing. I mean, yeah. they're just adjusting to the environment. Okay. All right. Um, Lindsay's calling us from Hartsville. We're glad to talk to you tonight, Lindsay. And what's happening up in your part of the world? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hey, how are you? Doing good. How are you? We're doing good, too. Is everything good in your garden, or can we help you with something? I have a youth tree and it's a rough one. It's probably five or six foot diameter, about 25, 30 foot high. A eucalyptus and all the tree? leaves on it are turning, yes ma'am, uh -huh. all the leaves on it are turning brown. Oh my goodness. Is there anything I can do for them or? Well, are they just turning brown or did they not turn brown when we had that cold weather? They just started a couple weeks maybe ago. They just started turning brown and mm -hmm. we don't know what to do with them. Okay. Well, Okay, let's see if we can get some help from these people who both of whom are arborists. So um, if they can't answer it, nobody can. Oh. Um, so he's got um, a eucalyptus tree, and a lot of them got hurt severely right off the bat, but his is turning brown now. I've actually heard several reports of this occurring this year. I think between the heavy rainfall and then the hard winter, that it really set the eucalyptus back, and I'm kind of seeing like a phytophthora root rot issue in them, and oh. where they're dying back. I mean, oh. I... I I've seen plenty of the silver dollar, mm -hmm. eucalyptus especially, being hurt by that. So, 
Um, and that's bad because so often they used to get killed back to the ground, but then would re the sprout. And, and, and sadly, Lindsay, I mean, this this hurts him. I know when you have this very large eucalyptus, yeah. but I've just seen recently probably a 20 footer mm. completely killed mm -hmm. by the polar vortices. I guess we had two or three of these mm -hmm. this past winter. It's really tragic. But his is interesting, where it apparently seems like it's alive, and then it finally it slowly now has it's declined. Declining. Root rot yep. may be one of the sad issues. Now, if that's what it is and he wants to replant, should he put it in another place? It would be smart to replant it somewhere else. And also, unfortunately, there's nothing he can do to, to save the, the okay. eucalyptus that is well, currently in decline. Well, they grow quickly. And he can put them in another place and, yes. and still have another wonderful yeah. one to cut and use for and smell yep. for them. Yep. Yep. It's time to rotate the plant out. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yep. All righty. Um, Adrian is calling us from Somerville, and um, I know y'all had kind of a cool day for your Azalea yeah. Festival, but I know people enjoyed being in your beautiful city. Yes, we did. It was a very nice time. Good. And it, what's happening that we might be able to help you with tonight? Well, I have some tomato plants. I've got uh, about 21 in three separate areas of my yard. Mm -hmm. Two areas are doing fine. One area, the tomato plants are wilting completely. No color change on the uh, leaves or anything. They just wilted. They kind of shriveled up on themselves. Okay. Are they all the same variety? Excuse me? Are they all the same variety of tomatoes? Yes, they're all heirloom uh, tomatoes, yeah. Oh, and, did, uh, and is this new ground that you've planted them in, or did tomatoes or other crops grow there before, last year? Uh, I've had uh, cucumbers there last year and squash, and uh, this is the first year I've planted the tomatoes in this area. Okay. Um, well, two areas are just doing fine, and one area isn't, and it's heirloom tomatoes, and even if Tony were here, he might just throw his hands up, but who's got an idea? <laughs> They're wilting. I, what I would suggest uh, for the caller is to get bring a sample to the extension office. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when I hear situations like this, immediately this, this chamber of horrors comes into <laughs> yeah. my mind, and I'm thinking about bacterial wilt. wilt. Now, and I really hope it's not he, that. Could he cut it and put it in water and look for To look for, for the milky strands? Uh, explain how that happens, just to eliminate but, well, our... Well, at least that, that would be a diagnostic uh, uh, way of seeing if you have bacterial wilt because of the bacterial streaming mm -hmm. in uh, the xylem tissues yep. of that cut stem. So you put that in a, in a clean glass of water, in a, a clear glass of water, and wait probably 30 minutes for the, to, to, for the presence of those milky strands mm -hmm. emanating from the cut stem. And there stem. really isn't anything you can do for that, unfortunately. No, no, but with something like this, this is serious stuff. I love that the question that you asked about what yep. was planted previously. We need to be rotating our gardens yep. on a regular basis, changing out the families that we put in there. And it sounds like he had cucurbits and some things. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so cucurbitaceae, yeah. a different family of plants, mm -hmm. which is great. We've got solanaceae in there right now, but I really feel a whole lift the whole plant out of the ground and have it taken to the extension okay. office perhaps have evaluated there if not the plant problem clinic and Meg Williamson does a really great job she there sure as a does. diagnostician. She's, she's great. Yes. Okay well um, oh, tomato problems already starting <laughs> and you know what they're gonna be with us now yep. and forever. That's just what we'd go through yes. to get one of those delicious garden tomatoes. But we have something delicious tonight that's just stress-free and trouble-free, and I'm going to go over to the side counter and learn all about it. And while I do, we're going to check back in with Teresa and find out what the activity is in the chat room. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. Well, it's always sad to hear about people's gardening problems, so we'll try to lift everyone's spirits with a beautiful photo that was submitted by Robert Hamlin, taken this past weekend on a Mother's Day hike at Mistletoe State Park in Appling, Georgia. This is a beautiful shrub in the tea family, and it goes by the a scientific name Stewardia malacodendron. Uh, you might know it as Silky Camellia or Virginia Stewardia. And the genus name comes from a man of botany known as John Stewart. And then the species is Greek for soft tree, and that refers to the little silky hairs that you find on the surface of the leaf. So there you go. There's my tidbit of trivia to add to your cap for those trivia nights um, that you might, you know, just never know when you need to pull out that information. Let's check in now with Amanda and her guests at the side counter. Thank you so much. That sounds so sweet, those little soft hairs. It reminds me of babies heads when they're getting a little fuzzy, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, but at any rate, um, we are so thrilled tonight that Jackie Moore from the South Carolina Specialty Foods Association has come, and Jackie has a wonderful guest with her tonight. Yes, I do. Thank you. I have Lavinia Saban, and she is with Lavinia's house out of uh, Mount Pleasant, and she has a wonderful curry sauce, or I guess more than one, but yes. you're going to tell us a little bit about it. Let's start with your original sauce here. Right. This is, we have three sauces now. This is our original one. 
Uh, this is our classic curry sauce, which we first developed two years ago. And uh, it's based on my mom's go-to chicken curry recipe. I ate it my whole life, loved it as a kid and as a grown-up. So we decided to go ahead and put it into a jar, and everyone has seemed to love it. <laughs> and there's several ways to use it, so you're going to show us some of the ways that you use your original yeah. sauce. Um, well, right here in the front is traditionally how we'd use it. You just bring it to a simmer, and then you would add your um, meat or vegetables chicken. to it. Chicken, I like chicken. that. Chicken, I did chicken. <laughs> you know, you're always wondering what to do with chicken. <coughs> I have a crisis about once a week about chicken. chicken. And so you can just put it right in the chicken and serve it over rice. It looks um, delicious. Thanks. And then you got to... Yeah, I, it, we, we wanted to show how you could use it in lots of different ways. So what we have right here is our um, turkey burger. We just put a little bit of the sauce, a little bit of salt, mixed it and in it's there. And it's actually in the turkey meat. It is in the turkey meat. Okay. Um, I actually uh, was trying to make it so it would be um, gluten-free, and I needed it to hang together a little oh. bit more. Mm -hmm. oh. So I didn't know what to do, and impromptu. So this is a binder. I needed a binder, nice. so I used a little, actually, um, cornbread in there as oh. well. And, and you see, these products are gluten-free and I think vegan also. Yes, they are gluten-free. Uh, we haven't gotten them tested yet, but we've been having people use them for a very long time with no problems. Um, when you talk about a curry sauce, tell us about that. People think of that curry that as a spice, <coughs> but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Right. I am so excited you <laughs> asked me that question because I get asked this like probably yeah. 20 times every time we were out there in public. So curry for Indians is really a consistency, like a stew or in New Mexico, a mole, and it's not a spice. Curry powder is actually something that is from the British when they came to live in India and they needed to recreate the flavors back in England when they didn't have cooks anymore. Okay. So these are fresh spices. And then what else, do, how else do you like to use this? What are the dishes? And I'm sorry, I've got a little bit of a Oh, dear. <laughs> um, well, actually, I put it in a taco because so sometimes my kids uh, get tired of having rice. Rice, And that's yes. very exciting. We just saute it up with a little ground meat. Great. And then you have a a variation you just came out, you said recently, two different variations, and this is one. It's not actually variation, it's a completely different completely sauce. Completely different sauce. This is my dad's vindaloo recipe. It is our spicier end. Okay. And so uh, what we've done there is um, I've just tried to recreate one of the hardest sauces that we have to make. Why is it so hard? It's so hard because it's not hard to make something hot, like blow your head off hot, no problem with that. I can do that all day long. But it is very hard to make something that's spicy and flavorful. And flavorful. And then yes. you've used it in several different ways. I have. What's the traditional way up there? Traditionally, same way. Um, I used a little bit of lamb in the sauce. They're great for the slow cooker. Just throw it in in the morning. It's ready by the time you come back in the evening. And serve it on rice. And, and then serve it on rice. Let's and then the other that. things that we've done is I did it over chicken wings. What I did was I just uh, grilled some chicken wings and threw the sauce on there. And again, we have this aioli, which is our classic sauce with mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. Right? And then this looks very traditional Southern. It is. Southern That's for my South husband's Carolina. benefit. Not <laughs> traditionally South Carolina, but he likes Swiss. his meat. <laughs> yes. He's from Minnesota, so okay. we have to keep him happy. Good. So what I did was uh, I, did, I just kind of grilled up some ribs, uh, traditionally, just like what all the cooks down here have told me how to do it. And I just finished the um, ribs with uh, the vindaloo sauce as a glaze. Wow. And then, of course, fried chicken. Fried chicken. <laughs> this is an interesting recipe. This comes out of Nashville. Uh -huh. um, I saw on an episode of some place that Nashville has hot chicken, which they do fried chicken, and they put a hot sauce on it. So I said, well, why don't we put our vindaloo sauce on I it? Why not? That's good. Yes. And then this is a really special. This is Sliders. One the sliders, yeah, and very close to my heart because what I basically did, I used the vindaloo sauce, but I combined it with two other specialty foods. Yes, I did. South Some of my buddies. <laughs> our there. buddies, yes. Our, our buddies, yes, yes. So what I did was I uh, put our vindaloo sauce. I need a little sweetness for the barbecue mm -hmm. flavor, and so I um, added a little bit of Sally's greatest. Let me get this right: peach, pepper, ginger, jam, just a yes. little bit. And I topped it off with my um, neighbor and my friend, Chef Ann's uh, firecracker corn relish over Looks biscuits. Wonderful. And you know, that's the way we cook in the South because we always use something that our friend brought us <laughs> and we find a way to incorporate it into what we do. And now you've got one that has 
coconut milk in it. Oh, my heart right? be still. How does it taste? <laughs> it is delicious. It is my mom's uh, fish curry recipe oh, or seafood uh -huh. recipe. Um, it has, the main thing I want to emphasize in that is it really has all natural coconut milk. A lot of coconut milk has preservatives. Really? And so we really searched high and low to get a very good quality. Very fresh. Yes. Very fresh and very good for you. So. And so what are the things that you've done with it? This looks like something I've seen <laughs> before, but I think it's got a different twist to it. It does. Well, there's nothing bad about that dish, of course, because that shrimp and grits right. our style with our coconut. Uh, and no doubt, stone South. ground grits from South Carolina. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And I actually put a little pimento cheese in there. Ooh, that is that. very South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my husband loves cheese. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what I all I did is I really just sautéed that shrimp up uh -huh. and put the sauce on. I made the grits according to all my friends' recipes down here. They, they taught. They can cook they those They did teach me. Yeah. They did teach me that. <laughs> so no, it, it wouldn't be the South if it weren't chicken salad. But I think that's a little bit different. It is, it is and it's not. Um, what I did was I just uh, went ahead and grilled my chicken. I put in the usual grapes in there. Um, I found these fabulous pecans from Molly another and me. Yes, yeah. Molly and me. I got them for Mother's Day. Oh. They're spicy sweet ones. Chopped them up, put them in there. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of this is I put about a tablespoon or I think about two tablespoons mm -hmm. of our coconut curry in there to mix it up. And I had to use very little mayonnaise. Oh, so, that's so really it's very low healthy. Fat. Low fat, yeah, okay. more low fat, and very tasty. Now I just don't, those look like black eyed peas to me, but I don't know what they're doing on this Indian spread. <laughs> well, I was blown away. I was actually with a friend, another friend up in Columbia, and he made that for a specialty food organization meeting, I think. Right. And I said, what are you doing making black eyed peas with our coconut curry? <laughs> he said, well, I made them up traditionally, but I just dropped a little bit of that oh. in there for a little oh. kick. And people loved it. And I thought, wow, OK, well, that sounds great. And since we like to eat them every day, we might as well have different ways to flavor them, shouldn't we? Absolutely. Be? And, and the, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, I just wanted to point out, you know, this is oh, the, the way my mom would yeah. normally make it, is I just kind of did a um, coconut crusted uh, uh, tile fish. And you cook the fish. fish actually in the sauce. Is that yes, what you I said? actually grilled this one a oh, little you bit. Did grill that one. And um, put it into the put the sauce on so the bottom. Afterwards. But normally, I just slide and it in. And in most of these, we have meat, but, but except this one, of course, is a vegetable. But you said these really lend themselves to people who want to use vegetables as the main ingredient in these sauces. And with the summer coming and fresh things, um, this is another example, I think, of how we can do just that. Absolutely. What I did was just steam some zucchini um, and then put the sauce in there, topped it with a little paprika. And the mm. beauty of it is I have people at the Mount Pleasant Market come up all the time. They're part of the cooperative a lot yeah, of the time, oh, of course, the, the yeah. vegetable cooperatives. Uh -huh. And they say, I got this like weird vegetable <laughs> that came in my, my, my potato. Okay. And I don't know what to do with it. And they're like, all I did was throw it in the sauce because I figured they'll be fine in there. So it lends itself, I would say that all our sauces are vegan and uh, they're all natural. You can keep them vegan. You can have, go ahead and have a nice vegetarian meal okay. in the day that's tasty. Well, it's really been fun, and I apologize for getting a coughing attack. It had nothing to do with any of this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we need to dust the studio. But, um, but I have been fortunate enough to try this, and, I'm a, and my family just loves Indian food, and they thought it was one of the most delicious things. So oh, I just well, can't you. wait to taste the others. And, and it's just so wonderful that we have such, Jackie, your, your, your members have such a variety of things they to do. add to the joy and of cooking And I like the way they use each other's <laughs> products Absolutely. together to um, cross whatever cross sample all their different wonderful it is products. Right. And it's I really think neat. we'll come back and just at the end of the show and find out exactly how to get in touch with you and find out more about your wonderful organization. Yes, we will. Thank you. Amanda. Okay. And thank you all. Thanks. And now we're going to check back in with Teresa. Teresa? Goodness, as usual, there is a wonderful aroma coming from the side counter, and it sparked lots of interest in the chat room, especially <laughs> the use on the shrimp and grits. You know, if you haven't visited the Making It Grow website recently, you are really missing out. So not only do we have a great Facebook page, but we have all sorts of information on the website, recent shows that you can watch in case you missed something, and shorts and web exclusives. This week, you'll definitely want to check out the outtake, which 
which is from today's featured segment at the Broad River Canal. If you click on that at the bottom of the page, you'll be able to view um, some sort of, I think, bloopers with Dr. Nelson and Amanda. I'm sure it will leave you laughing. Amanda, back to you. Well, you know, Dr. John does have that little sense of humor, and I think since I was his student, he was—he didn't—he doesn't um, think of me as a TV star. He thinks of me as a, a kid who was trying to make a good grade in his class, and he could say anything he wanted to me, and it was pretty <laughs> darn funny, I have to admit. <laughs> um, right now, we have someone calling us from Recon, Georgia. Aubrey's down there, and we're so excited to get a call from across the state line. How can we help you tonight? Yes, I, <clears throat> I have some pomegranate bushes oh, good. in my yard, uh -huh. and, and they're loaded with blooms. Great. But the blooms are falling off. Oh, well, have they ever set fruit before? Well, the, the plants are pretty good, oh, got some age on them, uh -huh. but every year they, they do this. Oh. I got one plant that's loaded with blooms, but it is falling off. Well, shoot, that's no fun at all, because it's fun to get them. <sighs> You know, pomegranates are funny because I think some of them are better at setting fruit than others. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, yep. Bob, tell me what you think about what this problem well, might be. Well, I'm just be. so jealous. Uh, my pomegranate died this winter <laughs> oh. because of the cold. Oh, but, but you're exactly right, uh, Amanda, that there are some pomegranates that are cultivated solely for the, the ability to produce fruit. And we all know that pomegranates are high in antioxidants whatever. Uh, some are just strictly ornamental, mm -hmm. and obviously we've got a lack of pollination going on here. Just trying to recall with regard to the flowers, are they male and female separate? In, in any event, we're not having pollination, the flowers becoming aborted. Yep. I like your question, have they fruited before? Because right now with the market, they're moving it to dwarf pomegranates, and the objective there is strictly flowers. Fruit is optional. Any thoughts on that? with regard to the, the flower abortion. Sometimes it occurs because of dry spells. Right, I mean, uh, uh, but well, and some of them just don't set flowers. Exactly. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, that, they're varieties right. that, are, that are selected to select, I mean, to set fruit. fruit. And I would encourage you to do a little research and find one of those. I, and I believe there's self-pollinating, because I have they one are. in my yard, and it has been nicely setting fruit. But then I got some of the little ones, and I've gotten fruit on the little ones, mm -hmm. which is really fun. And Corey Tanner did a really nice job on a pomegranate fact sheet at the HGIC website. Okay. So that would be a really good place to start. Yeah, that would be. All right. Well, get ready to, to, um, to get your backpack out and put some water in it, because we're going on a hike with Dr. John and the spring botany class at USC. I'm joining forces with my old college professor today, Dr. John Nelson. He is the head of the A. Seymour Herbarium at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. And we are with his spring flora class and they take field trips. John, we look like we've got a pretty good place for a field trip. Where are it's we? It's a really great place and uh, first of all I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, today we're going to be um, looking at the uh, botany, the plant life along the Broad River and where we are specifically is right at the upper end of a, a very extensive walkway, a greenway, uh, that's a part of the um, Columbia Riverfront Park. So you, we can hear the rushing waters at the Broad River uh, diversion dam over there, over that away, and uh, right behind us, I think we can see the um, old Columbia Canal, which of course that's where Columbia gets its water. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff out there this time of year. Let's get those kids and head them down the trail. Okay, let's see what they're looking for. This looks like an area that gets inundated periodically. What do you? What are the common things that you'd see in this sort of situation? Right, Amanda. This is what you'd probably call a natural levee environment, and there are there are quite a number of uh, native plant species that like to grow in a place like this, especially woody uh, species. This is so, a pretty beautiful one. Right here, we're we're sitting on top of this beautiful sycamore, and you're leaning it against a hackberry. And both of those are perfect examples of plants that like this environment. Um, this is one of my favorite trees, and um, it doesn't. You have to, sometimes you have to look up to see the beautiful patterns 
Mm -hmm. When it's young, it look, or it's lower down, sometimes you still have the bark on it. Right, and I, not only for a sycamore, but just about any plant, you can't just look at one part to really understand how it's best identified, but um, you need to be able to look at um, all of its parts, and that's what I try to tell my students to do, to take the whole uh, appearance of the plant in. So this is the, these are the new leaves on the sycamore. Sycamore, right. With those sticky buds. Sticky buds <laughs> and um, very interesting leaves that will expand tremendously um, once they really get going. So it's kind of like people, there are a lot of ways to identify. Sometimes it's a freckle on our foot and sometimes it's um, attached or detached ear That's lobes. right, you know, it's like trying to identify species and then realizing there's variation among species. Just like with people. Right. Yeah. Well, let's see what's farther down the road. Okay. I bet there's some mystery plants down there. Mm -hmm. John, it's amazing what we've seen today right here on the outskirts of Columbia. Right here on the outskirts of downtown Columbia. And one of them was a little spring wildflower that has a that has the apple in the name, but I don't think it's an apple family. Right, Amanda, that's the, um, the well-known May apple. It's not really a rare species, but a lot of people don't commonly see it. It's a little plant that's actually related to Nandina. It's in the, bur the barberry family and uh, it has some very peculiar uh, biochemical properties so that it has been used medicinally quite a bit. Well, one of my favorite trees because one of my, um, on, my, on my bucket list is to work out and have, have muscular arms and ironwood is such a fabulous, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but ironwood doesn't have to pretend to pump its muscle. Tell me about that tree. Musclewood or ironwood is one of my favorite trees in the forest. Likes to grow in wet places, especially in the bottomland hardwoods. And uh, the wood is so hard, it will dull an ax. If you wow. ever try to uh, chop one down, that's why they call it ironwood. And then musclewood or mussel tree, because as you say, the uh, sort of rippling effect of the wood underneath the bark. John, this looks like, um, in your phrase, vinorama. <laughs> um, there are vines mm -hmm. on everything. Why is this? Vinorama, this part of the world is known for a rich assortment of woody vines, and uh, we can certainly see them around here. And I know that we've already seen the, the native ones, the wild grape and supplejack, and of course poison ivy, mm -hmm. and cross vine, and there are others as well. Then there's some, unfortunately in this area, we see that the invasives have a pretty big foothold. What are some of the ones that are really problematic? Well, you know, we could stay with the vines if you wanted and just refer to wisteria. Oh. Uh, Asiatic wisterias are never welcome anymore uh, in natural areas in the state or anywhere in the southeast. And uh, beyond the vines, there are a number of invasive shrub uh, species, including um, uh, terrible things such as Russian olive. Mm -hmm. And then um, privet. Privet, of course, there are s to several species of privet that are getting worse and worse. And, um, and even. Um the ground cover ivy goes up the trees, doesn't Right, it? Yeah. and I guess that we'd have to count uh, English ivy as a woody vine too, but yeah. it really is an awful, awful pest. Fortunately, there are many wonderful things here, and we, are ended, we ended our walk by seeing two beautiful native trees in full bloom. Right, it's time for our beautiful red buds to be flourishing in the spring sunshine. And of course, red bud is a native tree species in the bean family. And uh, they're, they're delightful to look at all year long, but especially now with their beautiful flowers. And I tasted some of the flowers on a walk yesterday and they're real mm. good. What did it taste like? Um, it was a nice, slightly peppery taste. I think I'm gonna put some in a salad. Oh boy. And then the other one was a beautiful white, dangling, delicate tree. Right, and that's our lovely silver bell. It's one of a couple or three species that we have in the Southeast in the genus Halesia. 
and uh, it really is a pretty thing with four petals and the flowers always, as you said, dangle. They prominently dangle. Um, or drape, maybe is a more, drape, a more yes. gracious word. Um, <laughs> look at this wonderful, right outside Columbia, we have the beauty of the water, we have the trees, we have the sky, we have the birds, and then the wonderful plant life. Thank you for such a great tour. And tell me, I know you have a lot of these pressed in the herbarium, but there's a lot of information at the herbarium. Right, we have a good bit of information. Um, um, words and pictures and if anyone's interested in seeing what we've got please I hope they will go to our website which is easily available at um, herbarium.org couldn't be much easier than that to find on the internet thank you John for a wonderful day thank you Amanda What fun go stepping back in time and being a student and seeing the beauties of nature on that walk. It's so wonderful to have places that are right by our cities where we can get back and really see nature. And um, Vicki, Bert and and I saw a barred owl while we were out there. You just never know when you get off the beaten path what might be there. Um, I got to go, you know, wake up and say, what am I going to do if I had it two in the morning? And um, I went out in the garden and there was some dutsia blooming. Yep. So, I, you know, that wonderful old flesh and plant. And then there were some big old cabbage roses. And, um, and um, fortunately, the Japanese beetles hadn't found them yet. Right. Yeah. What a great color. Anyway, um, John's calling us from Charleston, the holy city. Um, how are things going down there in that wonderful part of the world, John? Um, the red plastic that Clemson has developed for growing tomatoes. Can y'all tell me what the benefit for that is? Of the... The red plastic. Oh, the red plastic for tomatoes. Uh, oh, well, it has a lot of benefits. Yes, it, uh, it's... It gets those thrips disoriented, I think. Yeah, that's an insect control. It reflects the far red light, and they uh -huh. don't like that, and it kind of distorts them and tries to keep them away. And uh, I don't know if the research has been conclusive yet, but where are we with that, Bob? Oh, gosh. Uh, I remember uh, Dennis Dakota at Clemson <coughs> University had studied that, plus uh, John Kelly also had worked <laughs> on that. And I'm... Uh, I talking to the they, researchers. I think, I think that the red actually does a little bit of good. You don't think so? I, I, I've got mixed feelings. I actually looked at a couple of the papers, and uh, I think it really depends on where you are in the part of the country. Okay. If you're if you're up north, uh, because it's very difficult to uh, replicate th these studies and get similar results. Uh, the red plastic was all supposed to, I think, somehow facilitate uh, ripening on these tomato plants, improve their ability to capture more sunlight. Yep. Um, well, you know what? One thing we can say is that the people involved with vegetable research in South Carolina are trying everything. Yeah. Everything and they we, can. Uh, and exactly. we certainly do appreciate that because one day we're going to get it just right, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that we do know that is just right is that um, the South Carolina Department of Agriculture has Jackie Moore encouraging us all to um, support our local farmers and our local um, entrepreneurs. And Jackie, we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And if you want to find out more about the South Carolina Specialty Food Association, please go to our website, www.scsfa.org. We have the members page, you can scroll down and see all of our members. You can go to the events page and see where we are. You can also follow us on Facebook and find out where we are and what we're up to. Now. Lavinia, how can we find out more about Lavinia's house? Well, two ways. So you can definitely check out our website, www.lavinia'shouse.com. Uh, also, we're on Facebook, uh, www.facebook.com backslash Lavinia's house. And you have recipes? I do. Bear with <laughs> me. As uh, we're small business, we'll get all these recipes up there. And we'll also get our new sauces up there. So just hang in there and check often <laughs> and share your recipes with us. Well, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to say to our friend Teresa how happy we are that she was with us tonight and for all the wonderful things she does for us here on Making It Grow. Thanks, Amanda. It's always my pleasure to be here. Thank you for all the congratulations in the chat room tonight, on the Facebook page. Um, 
it's nice to know so many people are wishing us well. Do continue to submit your photos. I know there's a lot that have been submitted, both of wildlife, just for enjoyment, and then questions about plant identification. Uh, we are here to answer your questions, but do be patient. There's just a few of us, so we'll do our very best to get back to you. Amanda? Thank you so much. And Bob, it's been a true pleasure having you here. And as I said earlier, we do enjoy hearing you with your guest on your day. And I think people have an opportunity to hear some people from the Botanical Garden. That's right. On May 15th, uh -huh. from noon until 1 on your day, we have Lisa Wagner. She is uh, the former uh, education director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden. We also have John Botifer, the senior horticulturist there. And we also have Kathy that wonderful girl who knows so much, and, it, and they certainly should tune in at noon and listen to the Your Day program. Kathy's going to hurt me, I know, if I don't get this right. Okay. Kathy Bridges, my dear friend uh, at the Botanical uh, Garden, will also be on the radio yeah. program Thursday from noon to one. Please tune in to your SCTV radio station. You really should do that, and we thank you so much oh, for making you. the trip down. Yeah. And since you say pecan and I say pecan, I'm wondering how you say what, what you sleep in, pajamas or pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, no, thank and thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It was so much fun having you here. I think we had a good time tonight, and we're going to have a good time every time on Tuesdays on Making It Grow. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.